History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 429th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we're going to be traveling through Nantucket and looking at all of the different haunted locations there. This came up on my radar because I had done the bonus cast this last week featuring one haunted location I'd found there. And as I was researching it, I stumbled across a whole bunch of other ones. And I went, wait a minute, there's a whole bunch of haunted places here in Nantucket. We need to do a whole show on it. But I had already researched the bonus cast. I'm like, well, I don't want to have to try to do something else. So this is the rest of Haunted Nantucket. Yeah, luckily there was enough to spread around. Yes. <laughs> have you ever been to Nantucket? I have not. I haven't either. I've gotten up into Cape Cod, but I never made it out to any of the islands. But before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Susie, Jeanette, with two T's, and Augusta. Thank you for joining us in our Facebook group. And now, this moment, Noddity. The moment in oddity was suggested by Sarah Lynn Jones. Helene Adelaide Shelby of Oakland, California, filed for the U.S. Patent Number 1749090 on August 16, 1927, for an invention she named Apparatus for Obtaining Criminal Confessions and a Photographically Recording Them. That's quite the mouthful. But what is really unique about this invention is that it entailed using a skeleton to extract confessions from criminals. A suspect would be placed in a small dark chamber facing a curtained area. The curtain would be lifted and there before the suspect would be a skeleton, surrounded by a translucent veil and lit from above and below by electric lights, which made the skeleton appear to be like a ghost. The skeleton had red light bulbs in its eye sockets. The invention also had a recording device, so that the tape could be used in court and a suspect could not retract their confession. Shelby wrote in her patent application that it is a well-known fact in criminal practices that confessions obtained initially from those suspected of crimes through ordinary channels are almost invariably later retracted, and that her invention could produce a state of mind calculated to cause a criminal, if guilty, to make a confession thereof. The skeleton's eyes could blink, and the examiner would ask questions through a megaphone behind the skeleton so it would perhaps be more believable that the skeleton was real and asking the questions. The apparatus was never built, and probably couldn't have been used past 1961 when the Supreme Court ruled that coerced confessions were not admissible in court. Using a skeleton with glowing red eyes to get confessions from criminals is an interesting idea, and if built, certainly would have been odd. This history podcast is haunted. And now, this month in history. In the month of March, on the 20th, in 1345, a conjunction of three planets is blamed for causing the Black Death. Every 20 years, Saturn and Jupiter form a conjunction in which they cross over each other in the sky. The most recent was December 21st, 2020. On this date in 1345, Jupiter and Saturn were joined by Mars in a triple conjunction. According to 14th century scholars, this conjunction was to blame for the Black Death that swept through Europe, the Middle East, and Asia during that century. 25 million people died during the plague. And as if blaming a conjunction of stars was not preposterous enough, others were blamed for the circumstances. People they referred to at the time as gypsies were blamed, 
as were witches or minorities like the Jews. As we know now, a bacteria caused the epidemic, and stars certainly have nothing to do with that. Nantucket is a small, isolated island off of Cape Cod and has long been a summer destination for people. This had once been a whaling hub and was originally home to the Algonquin Nantucket people. Fog regularly envelops the island, leading to it being nicknamed the Little Gray Lady of the Sea. It seems the perfect setting for a few ghost stories, and this little island has plenty of them. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of Nantucket. Nantucket Island is part of the state of Massachusetts and sits 30 miles south of Cape Cod. The name Nantucket was derived from the Algonquian names for the island, which meant something like faraway island. The original group that settled here were the Neantic, or as they called themselves, Nantucket. That name refers to being of long-necked waters, probably referring to a peninsula of land. They arrived from Rhode Island and Connecticut. The first European to arrive here was Bartholomew Gosnold, and that was in 1602. Kelly, I just want to address something here because we had somebody give us a negative review about this. I hope people know that when we say a place was discovered by a European, that we're doing it tongue in cheek. We all know if there's people already there and we've joked about it many times. It's not being discovered. It's not being discovered. (laughs) I hope people know that we do realize that the Europeans were not discovering anything. And even if there weren't people already there, we don't know who went and discovered all of these places before that. Because now, even with America, we know that there were Native American people here before. And way back when, we think the Egyptians might have been here. The Vikings were here far before Christopher Columbus ever did. I think there's a lot of history we will just never know. So I just want to address that right now. A man named Thomas Mayhew bought the island in 1641, but no one would settle here until 1659. And that would be a group of Quakers led by Thomas Macy, and the settlement was called Sherburn. Mayhew sold a large interest of the island to several other men for 30 pounds and two beaver hats, one for himself and one for his wife. (laughs) Those were very important. I guess. I mean, I know they were pretty expensive at the time. (laughs) When I was reading that, I was like, 30 pounds and two beaver hats? What? (laughs) You think, oh, well, two bars of silver or something. Right. New York was the first state to control the island, but it eventually passed to Massachusetts in 1695. At that same time, the name of the island officially became Nantucket. The first industries here were farming and raising sheep, but soon the whaling industry took hold. And the way it first started was to use the Native American population to row the small boats with one white Nantucketer on board running the show. So we had a little bit of slave labor going on here. That is the only way this became a successful whaling port. A great fire in 1846 devastated the island. Economic issues caused hardship, and the Civil War finished off the whaling industry because the boats were destroyed. The 1950s would spawn an era of growth as developers turned the island into a tourist destination and a luxurious place to live. Today, Nantucket is a summer play place for the rich. Single-family homes run at least a million here. And there's enough history to have spawned many ghost stories. Here are some of the reputedly haunted places on Nantucket. First, we have a place that isn't actually on Nantucket, but it's nearby, Tuckernuck Island. Tuckernuck Island is part of the town and county of Nantucket and is a very small island west of Nantucket. There are no paved roads here or electricity, and its remoteness is inviting for people looking for solitude and a chance to relax away from the chaos of the world. That makes this the perfect spot for a cryptid. The Yoho is said to live here, and the Native Americans have legends that claim that this griffin-like creature takes children who have been bad. Seems like a good way to get kids to behave themselves. There have been sightings of the Yoho, though. There's a statue of the creature in its full half-eagle, half-lion glory on the island. I mean, it's been sighted, right? If you see the statue, you've seen it. It's kind (laughs) of like seeing the Mothman in Point Pleasant when you see the statue. This is true. And Kelly, this seems like a perfect opportunity for another one of our songs that we can add to the HGB album. Pray tell. (laughs) Our listener, Jessica, suggested that we ought to be making an HGB album of all of our music. 
I oh, think it would Lord. sell like hotcakes. <laughs> People's ears bleed. So they have something to burn. <laughs> yo ho. Oh, yo ho. A pirate's life for me. Next, we have the Roberts House Inn. The Roberts House Inn is part of the historic district of Nantucket. The inn was built in 1846 in the Greek Revival style. Before this was on the site, there was a postage stamp house that burned to the ground in the Great Fire of 1846. Kelly, you and I were like, what is a postage stamp house? We tried looking it up and we couldn't find anything. So I'm not exactly sure what it's describing here. I thought it was always the size of the lot, but I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, it had, the term. it had to be bigger than clearly a postage stamp. So unless it's a little mouse living there. Well, no, but I, I mean that it's just like a tight lot. Yeah, I envisioned a smaller house, I guess. Real estate developer William Hussey bought the land and built the house, which was a private residence. His daughter Alice inherited the house and converted it to an inn in 1883. She operated that inn for 15 years and then it was auctioned off. John Roberts bought it and ran it as an inn also, and his daughters continued that work through to 1960. Roberts bought the Quaker Meeting House next door and remodeled that into a restaurant and added rooms to the second floor. Someone else bought and ran the inn from 1960 to 1974, and I don't know who that was. And then the O'Reilly family bought it, and in 1986, they bought the Royal Manor, which had been next to the Quaker Meeting House. So the complete property is three buildings, and two of them have ghost stories connected. The first story dates to 1977 and features the spirit of a young woman. An employee was down in the basement of the inn when they saw the young woman, and they described her as having long hair, and she was wearing a nightgown. This same apparition was seen later by another person on the third floor. The manor house has hauntings as well. Mike O'Reilly was running the property in the early 2000s when they were remodeling the manor house, and his cousin was doing some of the work. He was doing some carpentry one evening all by himself, and he left to get some dinner. He locked up everything tight before leaving. When he returned later, he looked up and saw a woman looking down from a window. He was shocked because he couldn't figure out how someone got in the building. He ran inside, but there was no one anywhere inside. A guest staying in one of the rooms claimed to feel as if something was floating over the bed. There's the old mill, which sounds like a really cool thing to see. The old mill in Nantucket is located at 50 Prospect Street and was built in 1746 by a sailor named Nathan Wilbur. The style is a classic Holland-like windmill, and it's thought to be the oldest functioning mill in the country. There had been four mills on Nantucket, and this is the only one still there. The construction of the mill is a bit murky and ownership as well. There were two men who ran the mill early on named Elia Kim Swain and John Way. White sails were used to turn the shaft that made the interior gears move the granite mill wheels. This was a grist mill and was used to grind corn. This ground corn would be used to make Indian pudding, cornbread, cornmeal mush, hasty pudding, and johnny cake. The sons of Swain and Way inherited the operation and they ran it until 1829 when Jared Gardner bought it for $40. He repaired it and continued to run it until 1834 when he tried to sell it, but he got no takers. His heirs inherited it in 1842 when he died. The Azores are a group of islands off of Portugal. Immigrants from here would travel to Nantucket and become millers. A group of them ran the mill until 1866 when Francis Sylvia bought the mill and he owned it for 30 years until he died in 1896. Nantucket's Historical Association bought the mill at that time. They restored it several times, and it still continues to grind corn today. Can you believe that? That's pretty cool. Yeah, I thought so. There's a spirit here that is believed to belong to a former mill operator. This is a protective spirit, and many believe that this is Timothy Swain, who died in the mill of natural causes. A worker named Ed Dugan, who ran the mill from 1977 to 1980, reported that whenever he left the helm of the mill, it would pick up speed and vibrate violently, and this would cause him to have to come back to where he was supposed to be. The places he would wander to were dangerous, so it seems someone was trying to keep him safe. Dugan tested his theory in front of people, and sure enough, the mill would pick up speed when he walked away. There was also a large gap in the mill's turning radius that workers would fill with wax. Islanders would save their candle nubs and give them to the mill. One night, Dugan filled up the gap with some of these nubs, and then he locked up for the night. When he returned the next morning, the wicks had been removed from the nubs, and they were sitting in two neat piles. He knew he didn't do that, and he was the only one with the key to the mill, so he assumed the spirit did this. Next, we have the Nantucket Cottage Hospital. 
The original Nantucket Cottage Hospital was founded in 1911 by Dr. John S. Gruard and Dr. Benjamin Sharp. The two men had a hard time finding a location, though. As Dr. Sharp put it in 1912, our hope and longings are for the hospital, but no house turned up in the accessible parts of town, which did not have a next-door neighbor who objected. Nobody wanted to live next door to a hospital, I guess. Wow. In December 1912, the old Charles S.D. homestead on Westchester Street that had three buildings was purchased. This property was used until 1957 when a new facility was opened to accommodate the growing needs of the island. The buildings then became a couple of private residences and a condo and then apartments. It was when this was apartments that ghost stories started to be told. The spirit liked to hide items from people, especially keys. These items would disappear for a while and then reappear. The basement apartment had a lot of activity, probably because it had once been the morgue. The tenants complained that it was always cold. Well, of course it was if it was the morgue. The landlord would check the furnace and it was always working, but the chill would never leave the apartment. A tenant claimed that his watch never worked right in the apartment. It was set to beep every hour, but in the apartment it would beep at weird times like 7 minutes till the hour or 12 minutes after. Outside of the apartment, it worked fine. And tenants often felt they were being watched by something they couldn't see. Now, the Jared Coffin House, and what a great last name. The Jared Coffin House is located at 29 Broad Street. The house was constructed in 1845 by Jared Coffin, who was a very successful whaler. The mansion is three stories and made from red brick with black shutters on all the windows and a slate roof. This was the first mansion on the island. The mansion escaped the great fire that happened the next year. Mrs. Coffin wanted to live closer to Boston, so the couple wasn't in the home long. Eben W. Allen bought the house and added a three-story addition with 16 bedrooms in 1857. That's a lot of bedrooms. It is, and considering that it was already a quote-unquote mansion on the island, they made it much bigger. The property was restored in 1961 and runs as a hotel with 30 rooms in the main building and 13 rooms in the Daniel Webster building located next door. Even though the coffins left the house early on, Jared seems to have returned. He liked to rock in the chair near the fireplace, and there's a rocking chair that reportedly rocks on its own whenever the fire is lit in the fireplace. The apparition of an elderly man is seen sitting in it, too. He likes to appear in room 223 as well. There are other spirits here as well. Shadow people make appearances, and there's the specter of a Puritan woman. She visits the rooms of unmarried couples who are sharing a bed. (gasps) Scandalous. It is. She will yank the covers off the couple or just stand over the bed, glaring menacingly. That'll make you stop. Nobody's getting pregnant in that place. Sinners! <laughs> and how does she know they're unmarried? This is true. Hmm. Maybe they just don't wear rings. I, yeah. They might have taken them off at the sink or something. Items move around on their own. And the ghost of a little girl has been seen. User CLJD3 wrote on TripAdvisor in 2007, We stayed here for two nights in a family room with my husband, myself, and four-year-old son. The room was large, had a pull-out sofa for our son, canopy beds with nice linens. It was clean. Building we were in was from the 18th century, very settled, sloped floors, spooky. And you know, we know anytime there's those sloped floors in these places, it kind of gives you a haunting feeling sometimes. First night, my bathroom door moved a few times. I was told a tale from someone who had worked at the inn once at dinner on the second night. I was scared when I got back to my room, although nothing scary happened to us. So it must have been a scary tale that they were told. Oh, it is going to say what it was. We were told the room is haunted by a lady named Phoebe, who was a Puritan and gets quite upset by unmarried guests. We were happily married and safe. She will pull the covers off while you sleep and then appear scowling at the foot of the bed. I was so scared I hardly slept at all, clutching my covers to me. Definitely did not need to hear that story after dark. My son's DVD player was playing when we came back to the room, Sleeping Beauty. She must have enjoyed the music. I was certain we had turned it off. That was the worst of it. My husband and son were fine with it, and we had an overall good stay. I don't think it was a synchronicity that it was playing Sleeping Beauty. The spirit was probably letting them know that she approved and she wouldn't be bothering them. That could be. While they slept. Yeah. I would have taken it as a positive sign. (laughs) Exactly. Next, we have the Walwinnett Hotel. This hotel has welcomed guests for nearly 150 years. It's tucked away from the hustle and bustle of the downtown area of Nantucket. The hotel was built in 1875 by ship captains and named for the chief of the tribe that once inhabited the eastern section of the island. 
One of the draws of the hotel in the past, and still is in the present, is the food. The hotel would host shore dinners, serving up boiled lobster, clam chowder, and decadent pastries, and cost 75 cents. I'm in. Heck yeah. Lobster, clam chowder, and pastries? You can have my clam chowder because I always get the grit. Oh. But I'll chow down on the, the lobster and the pastries. Okay. I'll just chow down on the lobster. <laughs> <laughs> you can have the pastries too. Okay. Dances would follow the dinners on the regular. Asa Small bought the hotel in 1882 for $1,700 and added a laundry and new bathhouses. James A. Backus managed the Wawanet starting in the mid-1890s, and then he bought it after the turn of the century, and his family would own it until 1978. He added a second floor and a veranda to the front of the hotel, complete with rocking chairs. The Wawanet Casino was built in the early 1900s, but this wasn't a place to gamble. It was a restaurant with a five-piece orchestra and became the most popular restaurant on the island. Robert B. Bowman's became the new owner in 1978, but he didn't hold it for long, selling it to the Carp family in 1986. They did an extensive renovation and redecorated, reopening in 1988. The reason this hotel may be haunted is that there's a rumor it was built on an old Indian burial ground, as all uh-huh. of these places are. All the regular haunts like lights flickering and doors and sinks having minds of their own happen here. But there is also the phantom smell of roses and gardenias, which are smelled in different areas of the hotel. And one of the stranger phenomenon is the sound of running water in the lobby, but there's no fountain or other water decor in the lobby. Disembodied voices are also heard, and that sometimes is in the form of echoing laughter. Now we have the Nantucket Hotel and Resort. The Nantucket Hotel and Resort opened in the summer of 1891 as the Point Breeze Hotel. It was built on Brant Point, where shipbuilding had previously been the main industry. There were 40 rooms, and each was equipped with electric bells to ring the hotel lobby for service. An early ad for the hotel reads, The Point Breeze Hotel again offers its patrons all those excellences which have made it so widely known to and sought by cultured persons wishing the comforts without the cares of housekeeping. The cheery dining hall is furnished with individual tables, nicely appointed, and here is served a variety of foods to suit all palates. Delicately concocted dishes to tempt the appetite and food more substantial to appease a seaside hunger. The cuisine of this hotel cannot be excelled. An orchestra furnishes music in the dining hall. The hotel office, with its paneled walls and beams, suggests the living hall of some English country house. That the guests shall lack no facilities for entertainment and comfort, the hotel contains a large amusement hall, with waxed floors for dancing. Roomy sun parlors is surrounded by broad shaded piazzas, and the grounds contain tennis courts and well-kept lawns for croquet. The hotel still offers live music and New England clam bakes. In 1900, the East Wing was added to the building. In 1925, a fire raised the West Wing and the tower. The hotel started in the Folger family and remained there in the 1930s when Gordon Folger Jr. took over the operation. His grandfather had originally built the hotel. He renamed the hotel the Gordon Folger Hotel and added a new restaurant he called The Whale. This is today called the Breeze Bar and Cafe. The Gonella family bought the hotel in the 1990s and refurbished it and changed the name back to the original. The Snyder family bought the hotel and renovated it, reopening in 2012 as the Nantucket Hotel and Resort. This is the only full-service hotel on the island that is open year-round. The hotel seems to have several ghosts hanging out, though no one knows who they are. Full-bodied apparitions are seen in period clothing, and guests claim to feel they are being watched. Disembodied voices are also heard. Next, we have the Nantucket Whaling Museum. The Nantucket Whaling Museum is located at 15 Broad Street. William Hodwin and Nathaniel Barney partnered to open the Hadwin and Barney Oil and Candle Factory in 1847. They didn't move into the building that now houses the Whaling Museum until the following year. This is a Greek Revival industrial building. It was part of a complex of buildings that produced oil and candles. The oil was used to not only light lighthouses along the Atlantic coast, but was shipped to London and Paris to light street lamps. Whaling ended in Nantucket in 1869, so the building became a warehouse. Then an antique store opened there. William F. Sanderson had collected whaling artifacts over the years, and he donated the collection to the Nantucket Historical Association. They bought the former factory in 1929 to display the collection, and in 1930 the Whaling Museum opened. A woman visiting the museum had a weird experience. She was looking at a portrait hanging on one of the walls, 
and she became mesmerized by the image of a man in the portrait. Her sister said it was like the woman was in a trance. She had to physically shake her to get her attention again. The woman told her sister that she felt as though she knew the man, perhaps in a previous life. She later found out that there was a strange story connected to the picture. The man had claimed to be in love with a mermaid. I was like, well, that is a weird story. (laughs) Very much so. So um, was this woman supposedly a mermaid in her previous life? (laughs) By the way, when I was looking up ghost stories on Nantucket, they do have ghosts here at the Whaley Museum that are holograms. They just opened this up recently. These are holographic spirits that share about the history of the island and whaling. So there are different people that had once lived there. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I thought it was very cool. So, you know, I mean, they have actors and stuff, but they're just holograms. Next is the Hadwin House. The Nantucket Historical Association also manages the Hadwin House located at 96 Main Street. This was built by William Hadwin and is a gorgeous white Greek revival style mansion. The mansion was built in 1846 by local builder Frederick Brown Coleman. Coleman was known for his intricate carvings and pillar designs, and this is on display at the Hadwin House. The facade of the house has four colossal pilasters rising the two and a half stories of the clapboard house. These are part of the pedimented Ionic portico. The mansion was eventually owned by Gene Sattler Williams, and he gave it to the Nantucket Historical Association in 1963. In 1964, the Hadwin House was opened to the public as a house museum. People can tour the house and see period furniture some of which had belonged to the Hadwins. The silverware on display is also original to the house, and the former owners still seem to love their silverware. In 2018, Jan Wilson 515 wrote on TripAdvisor, From what I hear, the Hadwins had many parties and dinners at this house. You can see the original china on display, and the interns who sleep upstairs often hear dishes and glasses clinking, chairs being moved, and laughter and chatter. But when they come downstairs, of course, it is dark and quiet. No one is there. Next is the Ship's Inn. Obed Starbuck was a very successful whaling captain, and he built the Ship's Inn that sits at 13 Fair Street in 1831. Starbuck inspired a main character in Moby Dick, the first mate. And yes, this is where Starbucks gets its name, too. The rooms in the inn are named after the ships in Starbucks' fleet. Fun fact, one of the rooms was named Spermo, but that had to be changed since too many keys with the name went missing. Everybody needs a (laughs) naughty souvenir, right? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) The inn was recently restored and offers 10 rooms with private baths. There's also a restaurant at the inn. Ellie Gottwald is the owner of the inn with her husband, Mark. She is better known as actress Ellie Cornell and played Rachel Carruthers in Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, and Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. And that seems fitting, since the inn is said to be haunted. There are stories that a couple of ghosts haunt the property. Obed Starbuck is thought to be one of the spirits. He's known to walk around the hallways at night. Ellie says the captain likes to gaze out the front window towards the sea. She has seen him. She said, I saw him once. It was late one night when I was painting upstairs. He went through one closed door, then right through the wall to the next room. And I thought it was cool to find out where Starbucks gets its name from. Absolutely. Next, we have the Sherburn Inn. This inn had originally been the Silk Factory. Silk was a big commodity in the mid-1830s. William H. Gardner, William Coffin, and Samuel B. Tuck got together to create the Atlantic Silk Company, and they built a massive building on Academy Hill. The company had one of only two power looms in the whole world. They planted white mulberry trees, which were needed for feeding the silkworms. But the soil of the island is sandy, and the trees didn't thrive. By 1844, the silk business was done in Nantucket. The east side of the building was converted into a guest house, which is today the Sherburn Inn. This is a Greek revival style. The inn passed through many hands and is now in the hands of TPG Hotel, Resorts, and Marinas. The inn offers eight guest rooms. A couple of the owners were Susan Gasperich and Dale Hamilton. They had bought the inn in 1994, and the previous owner told them the inn was haunted. This owner had seen the apparition of a woman wearing a white Victorian dress with long red hair. Soon, weird things started happening to Susan and Dale. A guest told Susan one morning that she had been awakened at 2 a.m. and that she saw a misty, cloud-like figure moving through the room. She had thought it was a dream until her husband told her that he woke up at the same time and saw it as well. Another guest was locked out on his balcony, and he had to yell for help. The ghost gives off a feeling of peace, but can be a bit of a prankster. One prank happened to a couple staying in room 5. 
They heard the sound of fingernails scratching down the wall above the headboard. This happened over and over, starting at the top of the wall and scratching downward. The couple just threw the blanket over their heads and tried to sleep, hoping nothing would appear. Yeah, it's your shield. I mean, it's the best thing to do, you know. (laughs) A resident who had lived in the building in 1978 claimed that she heard knocking on her apartment door, but no one was there. She also saw the apparition of the woman and often felt as though she were being watched. And our final location here on Nantucket is the Nantucket Unitarian Church. The Nantucket Unitarian Church was once known as South Church on Orange Street. This had originally been the Second Congregational Meeting House Society, and their building was constructed in 1809. This is a very distinctive building with a large bell tower capped with a gold dome. The bell was cast in Lisbon, Portugal, and was brought over in 1812. The first town clock was added to the tower in 1823 and was electrified in 1957. The Goodrich organ was added in 1831 and is the oldest American-built organ still in use. The church is officially known today as the Second Congregational Meeting House Society Unitarian Universalist. Quite the mouthful. (laughs) Yes, it is. The first minister here was Seth Freeman Swift. He served from 1810 to 1833, and during his tenure, the congregation considered themselves Congregationalists. After he passed away, the people voted to be Unitarians. This may have set Seth off because he is haunting the heck out of this church. His apparition has been seen many times, and people recognize him because a portrait of him hangs in the church and reveals his long, lean face, square chin, spectacles, and auburn hair. Fuddy Van Arsdale, and what a name, Fuddy... (laughs) was a former sexton, and she was alone in the church cleaning one evening. She suddenly heard heavy footsteps coming towards her, but she didn't see anybody. Buddy started whispering a hymn to herself to ease her nerves, and the footsteps stopped. She didn't hear them retreat, so she was still unnerved. She had heard stories that Seth Swift haunted the place. Now she was a believer. After that evening, she always says hi to Seth whenever she entered the church, and he never snuck up on her again. Bob Lehman was a member of the church, and he told the Pelican Pub, I've heard all about Seth. The old sextons told stories about being here at night, and they'd hear people walking upstairs, but when they check, they couldn't find anyone. Seth is an old ghost, you know. He doesn't approve of everything we do. I've not run into him, but then I'm afraid of the dark, so I don't come here at night. Seth is everywhere. He's taken on a life of his own. Seth has a habit of banging on the vestry windows, but he will stop when people yell out for him to do so. One day, some boys were being rambunctious in the upper part of the church. The custodian heard them tear down the stairs and go out the door, slamming it behind themselves. It was icy cold outside, so he thought it was weird that they would leave the warmth of the church. They soon returned because of the chill and tapped on the window to be let in. The custodian was perturbed because he had just let them in not long before this, so he demanded to know why they left if they were only going to bother him to be let back in again. The boys answered, We were scared. A man jumped out from behind the pulpit and chased us. He didn't want us there. The custodian assumed it was Seth because he was the only man in the church. Seth may not be the only spirit here. Susan Gerald was the music director from the late 1970s through the early 1980s. She said, I was sitting at the organ practicing one Sunday morning before service, and two soldiers marched in wearing Revolutionary War garb, red pants, swords, black hats. Despite the scare, Gerald continued to practice playing, and the ghosts left. Can you imagine you're just like, Oh, no, there's a couple of revolutionary ghosts. I'll just keep <laughs> do 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 to do Imagine the New England clam bakes and lobster boils that took place here. I'm getting hungry already. I know, my stomach <laughs> just growled. The scent of the sea breeze enveloping you as you relax in a chair on the lawn. Perhaps a boat or two is taken to the water. Nantucket sounds like a dreamy place to visit, especially back during the Victorian era. So much from that time still seems to permeate the island. Have spirits continued to stay on here? Are these locations in Nantucket haunted? That That is for for you to decide. decide. Well, I'm pretty positive we'll probably never make it to Nantucket. It's a long ways to get up there and then take a ferry to get over. And We just need a month for road tripping. (laughs) We need more than that if we're going to visit all these places we talk about. We'd love to have you visit our website at historygoesbump.com. And if you need to send us some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com or any of the places where you can find us on social media. Kelly, we heard from our listener, Sarah, in the Spooktacular crew. And this goes back to the episode we just dropped about Haunted Cemeteries 22. And in it, we talked about Swan Point Cemetery. And Sarah had shared an experience she'd had there 
a little while ago in the crew, but she hadn't said where it had happened. So then she's like, wait a minute, you know that experience I shared not too long ago? This is where it happened. I'm going to share that with everybody here. This is where I had my freakiest and maybe first paranormal, possibly, experience. The greenhouse used to be where my brother-in-law lived with a bunch of other guys. He lived in the basement. So he was pretty much roommates with the people in this Revolutionary War graveyard. Wow. (laughs) My husband and I would sleep down there when we were home on leave. One night I woke up in an absolute panic and completely terrified. I just had a feeling that I had to get out of there right now. I know some weird things can happen in that space between sleeping and waking, but this was a feeling I'd never felt before. So I woke my husband up and made him sleep upstairs in the living room with me. He made me sleep on the floor because he was so mad. (laughs) Oh my gosh. But my leave was over a week before his was, so I left. And one day he was alone down there on the computer and the exact same thing happened to him. Just sudden, absolute terror and he ran out of there immediately. We never told anyone until years later because we were soldiers and we were supposed to be brave. But the other guys who lived there each had a similar experience. All but my brother-in-law who thinks anything paranormal is absolute nonsense. (laughs) So I thought that was cool that they were staying in the greenhouse there at Swan Point Cemetery. And sure enough, they had a weird feeling there. Yeah, definitely. And I remember her sharing that story. I just didn't had no idea that. That's where it was. Yeah, and it's cool because I was having a hard time finding any other haunting stuff other than what happens at H.P. Lovecraft's gravesite. And so now we know there's some other stuff going on there, possibly. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to welcome into the cemetery, Crystal McCurry. We're going to be burying you under an obelisk tombstone. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. We really could not produce this show without you. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting. And join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us. So for some of you out there, as we are beginning this episode, (laughs) Kelly started saying a little poem about Nantucket. Maybe some of you know how that goes. (laughs) We can't share it on our show because this is PG. (laughs) Suffice it to say that it's talking about male anatomy. And now on with the show. I can't believe you'd never heard that poem. I think I was in grade school when I heard it. You know, I'm sure I heard something similar because when I was saying, oh, we're going to do Haunted Nantucket, I was thinking something in my brain that rhymes with it. So <laughs> I'm sure that I heard it somewhere and it was in the back crevices of my brain. One of those things that I filed away for. Don't ever bring this to the surface again. Apologies to anyone that lives in Nantucket. <laughs> <laughs> Shelby wrote in her pant pantin in her panty. She wrote in her panties. What? <laughs> Today, Nantucket is a small play place for the rich. <laughs> small. Summer Where do they even sm- get small? <laughs> Summer turned to small. It's a small play place. <laughs> Give me some new glasses. Do they have a ball pit? <laughs> <laughs> it's like McDonald's play place. Yes. Tuckernut Island is part of the town and country of Nantucket. It's but, like a town and country mobile <laughs> <laughs> minivan. Nantucket has become its own country now. <laughs> I bet they're so thrilled. Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's life for me. We pillage, we plunder, we rifle and loot. Drink up, me hearties, yo ho. We kidnap and ravage and don't give a hoot. Drink up, me hearties, yo ho.
Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's life for me. We extort, we pilfer, we (laughs) twilt. Who, what, where? We don't know what we're doing. We extort and pilfer, we filch and sack, drink, drink up, up me hearties, yo ho. Marauding and embezzle and even hijack, drink up me hearties, yo ho. Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's life for me. White sails were used to turn the shaft that made the interior gears move the granite mill wheels. Wills? 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 There were wills. Page, paging Will Wheaton? <laughs> How about wheels? Wheels? Get those mail wheels. <laughs> White sails were used to turn the shaft that made the interior gears move the granite mill wheels. Mail wheels. I can't do it. <laughs> mail wheels. The basement apartment had a lot of activity, probably because... <laughs> when there's too many bees and too many peas, it's just like... The apparition of an elder... <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want to say elderly today, do you? Yeah, there. I'm like the bird sitting on the shoulder. Kiwi always yeah, does this little, little garbly. Like, He's probably <laughs> saying all <laughs> kinds of rude <laughs> things about us and we don't even know. Well, it's always when you and I are having a conversation and it's like he's trying to interrupt and be part of it. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> she will yank the covers off the cubble. 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 <laughs> That's the P's and B's for you gobble, today, gobble. baby. <laughs> Very settled, sloped floors, spooky. So, of course, we're talking about sloop floor, slooped floors. <laughs> is it a slooped floor and a sloop? <laughs> Do you know what a sloop is? A boat. Thank you. <laughs> First night, my bathroom door moved a food. Fo- God, I cannot <laughs> talk. You've got Foo Fighters on the brain. Oh, I feel Taylor so bad because the drummer died. First night, my bathroom door moved a food. Golly. What is the problem? <laughs> That's okay. Just for once, you'll have more bloopers than me. <laughs> I guess so. First night, my bathroom door mute. <laughs> it mewed. I give Mew. up. Mew. Where's my white flag? Kitty, 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 kitty. <laughs> Mew. God. There were 40 rooms and each was equipped with electric bells to ring the hob- Hobby Lobby. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I didn't know Hobby Lobby was around back then. <laughs> 